So I wanted to basically talk uh, kind of um, in, with this broader, broader question, um, why um, did Russia invade Ukraine, um, how to understand what's going on on the ground, including Ukrainian resistance, and how this conflict might end, what are the prospects for peace. So I wanted to um, approach this broad question with three sort of sub-themes, if you wish. Um, I wanted to talk about the evolution of Ukrainian-Russian relations um, starting in 1991, um, although I won't be spending too much time on history, but to show basically how uh, over the last 30 years, Russia and Ukraine have diverged in various ways, which eventually led to this confrontation. So uh, even though you have probably all heard the narrative about so-called brotherly people, and that has been President Putin's claim that Ukraine is not really a separate state, but um, in various ways historically um, and otherwise, a part of Russia. That's actually is not the case. And I wanted to um, really convey this point, how things have changed within Ukraine and um, in between Ukraine and Russia. Right. And then I'll talk a little bit um, about what sort of is happening on the ground now, and especially why Ukrainian resistance not only has been so robust and effective, but also how Ukrainians are very united on the question of needing to win this war and are, um, even though the sacrifices are great, but there is very little appetite in the Ukrainian society for any kind of compromise with Russia, giving it some territory in exchange for peace. And that's something that I think is important to understand as we consider how this conflict might end. Right. And finally, I'll talk about sort of what is potentially, obviously nobody can predict the future, but just what is potentially more and less likely um, to happen um, as far as uh, the eventual outcome um, of this. So let me start. Um, let me see if I can is quick Hold on. yes so um on this growing incompatibility um in, in between ukraine and russia and kind of divergence of preferences i want to start with the issue of identity um, and talk about a few things um how starting with the fall of soviet union the collapse of soviet union in at the end of 1991 from the very beginning there was a somewhat different understanding on the part of russian and ukrainian leaders um, as to how future relations might unfold uh, Ukrainian president at the time, um, Leonid Kravchuk, famously called uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union a civilized divorce. But from the Russian perspective, uh, even though President Yeltsin at the time was locked in the power struggle with Gorbachev, he was one of the three signatories um, of this uh, Belovezhia agreements that were signed in contemporary Belarus that brought an end to the Soviet Union. But there was always, I would argue, kind of sentiment within Russian public and the leadership that this separation is in some way temporary. Yes, they may not be no longer a single state like the Soviet Union, but somehow Ukraine and Russia are not going to part ways. And if anything, there would be greater integration between the two countries over time. Um, but that's not what happened because the processes within Ukraine um, after the country became independent in December 1991, um, unfolded in the direction of strengthening and growing of distinct Ukrainian identity, um, which was, you know, as time went by, kind of was becoming more and more in conflict with Russian vision for Ukraine, as again, in some sort of political union, formal or informal, um, but basically, um, you know, that this idea that Ukraine can go its separate ways was getting more and more currency within Ukraine and was not really received um, in Russia. And there are additional factors that I would, you know, we could think about sort of how Russia felt humiliated um, over its situation in the 1990s, the cult of the Second World War, and basically anybody who opposed, and that's kind of more picks up under Putin, uh, who would oppose Russia essentially is labeled as a Nazi. And that's, we have this narrative about Ukraine being run by Nazis. I'll come back to that. And then final sort of point on the identity I want to make, and I'll be illustrating all of these three points that I have here on the slide with some visuals in a minute to just show you, you know, what, what it actually meant in practical terms as far as popular attitudes and elite choices, that um, these processes of Ukraine identity becoming more distinct and more anti-Russian, if you wish, more pro-Western, really accelerate in 2013-2014 following these Euromaidan protests when, at the time, authoritarian president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, uh, was driven out after he refused, under Russian pressure, to sign uh, association and free trade agreement with the European Union. Um, so once Yanukovych was driven out, Euromaidan protests succeeded. That's, that's when the war essentially starts. Um, Russia annexes Crimea. Um, it starts um, support insurgency in eastern part of Ukraine and in Donbas. Right. And these processes further accelerate uh, westernization, Ukrainization, and sort of turn away from Russia within Ukraine. So in a way, it's ironic 
Putin, you know, supposedly, according to his narrative, right, is invading, has invaded to keep Ukraine and Russia closer together, but it's exactly this aggressive behavior of the Russian leadership that produced the anti, anti-Russian anti Ukraine that Putin so, so much uh, wanted to avoid. So let me spend a little bit of time um, going over um, over these points with some il- illustrative, um, you know, po- polls and charts just to kind of show you what I really mean. So these are the three leaders who signed this Belovezhia agreements um, that sold the Soviet Union after conservative coup against Gorbachev, um, Soviet president failed um, in August 1991. And then by December 1991, Ukraine held independence referendum um, where over 90 percent, here's the data from that referendum, so a declaration of independence was adopted by Ukrainian legislature at the time still a republic of the Soviet Union, and then um, the declaration was put to a vote, as you can see, it produced overwhelming support uh, for independence from the Soviet Union, including in place like Crimea, where the support was smaller, but still majority voted for independence, and in eastern Ukraine, uh, again, somewhat smaller percent, but still robust um, support for independence. So, uh, you know, going back to these uh, fine gentlemen who actually all um, died, and the, the, President Krachuk was the last one to, to pass away just recently, so it's really kind of a turning point in history in some sense, but uh, Ukrainian leadership perceived this dissolution of the Soviet Union and the signing of this very loose uh, uh, not even a confederation, like an agreement was created, Commonwealth of Independent States, a civilized divorce from, you know, kind of joint past with Russia. But this is not how um, the future was perceived um, on the part even of Russian Democrats, not to say that they were imperialists in the same way that Putin was, but this idea that Ukraine and Russia somehow organically belong together, that they have common origin, common destiny, and over time can only grow closer together was felt and we have, you know, good historical evidence now that even that's how Yeltsin reasoned at the time himself. Now, so if we begin to see sort of why that was the case, again, I'm not going to go deep in history, but just for those of you who may not be familiar in Ukrainian history, it's very complex, very interesting. Essentially, it was a stateless nation, which is not unique in East European context. There were other um, nations that, you know, statehood comes much later for many of them after the First World War for the first time. And in Ukraine, actually, there was an attempt to establish independent state after um, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire, that was a very short-lived state from 1917 to 1921, and eventually Bolsheviks win and take over. But historically, parts of today's Ukraine were ruled by different um, other polities. So part of it was under Austria-Hungary, uh, polish Lithuanian Commonwealth before the seven, you know, late 1700s, and then Russian Empire begins to expand once Poland was um, partitioned, um, the Russian rule extends to the territory of today's um, southern and eastern Ukraine. And because of this kind of complex historical, you know, national linguistic and various um, identities that existed in Ukraine, society had was very diverse. Um, so we can see that, you know, on this map, for example, like where, including the boundaries of the short-lived um, Ukrainian uh, People's Republic that only lasted from 1917 to 1921, then in the interwar period, Today's Western Ukraine is you know, part, part of um, Poland um, and some smaller parts uh, are within Romania and um, Czechoslovakia. Um, and then um, after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact um, that Stalin and Hitler signed in 1939, Soviet rule extends towards today Western Ukraine, right? So to the yellow part here, uh, the Polish territories that were gained as a result of Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and Soviet rule was established um, in this part of Ukraine firmly after the end of the Second World War, right? So because of this kind of different history of Ukrainian people um, existing under different empires, when uh, Soviet rule is established in Ukraine, we, uh, Ukrainian sort of the strengths we can see of Ukrainian identity varied substantially by region. So this map uh, is based on the 1989 census. It shows, among other things, sort of focusing specifically on the linguistic um, aspect of Ukrainian population that, um, sorry, on the on the ethnic aspect, right? So majority of the population were ethnic Ukrainians, but there were substantial Russian minority, about 22% at the time of Soviet collapse, and they were concentrated um, in the East of Ukraine. Important to keep in mind that there was only one majority ethnic Russian region, which was Crimea. This is the only region where ethnic Russians were majority. In other parts of Ukraine, Ukrainians were um, ethnic majority, but you know many people actually spoke um, Ukrainian rather than Russian, and sort of had this kind of mixed identity. Yes, they thought of themselves as Ukrainian, but also as Soviet. 
you know, again, if you primarily speak Russian, they may have said on the census Ukrainian is a native language, but they didn't really speak it, right? So here, language actually politically had more significance in Ukraine than ethnicity as such. And uh, for example, here we can see on the um, in the people who indicated Russian as their native language as opposed to Ukrainian, it's a higher percent. So basically many ethnic Ukrainians, especially in the parts of Ukraine that were under Soviet and Russian rule for longer, were basically Russified um, in the Soviet period. You know, if you live in an industrial center in particular, outside of rural areas, it was at least unpopular and sometimes even politically dangerous to sort of be actively um, speaking Ukrainian, even I can you know, speak from personal experience growing up in the late Soviet Union at a university, for example, students who spoke Ukrainian in the hallways were considered politically suspect and they were not infrequently actually called to the KGB to be asked, like, why do you do this, right? Like the sort of, you are here in the civilized setting, right? And Russian was really the language of political advancement. And if you stick to Ukrainian, there was some, something kind of wrong with you. So, but anyway, so this linguistic divide was there. As you see, it's kind of gradual, sort of where exactly the border was um, is not necessarily clear, but the broader point that I was trying to, to show here that this Ukrainian identity was a complicated um, mix of attitudes. So yes, majority ethnic Ukrainian population, but um, you know many ethnic Ukrainians who were Russian speakers and sort of their um, attitude towards Ukrainian statehood, Ukrainian nationhood, Russia, Soviet past was quite uh, complex and oftentimes, you know, maybe not as really clearly pro-Ukrainian, right, as some nationalist activists, for example, uh, would have wanted. So this is just to show you that this really not simple divide between ethnic Russian, ethnic Ukrainian, even Ukrainian speaking or Russian speaking, there was also many people who spoke both Russian and Ukrainian, right? So this kind of blurred multiple dual identities was really one of the defining features in Ukraine uh, through the 1990s, um, at least. Now, um, even think about political attitudes, foreign policy preferences, you know, preferences for things such as economic reform, orientation towards the West or towards Russia, um, sociologists divide Ukraine into these four regions, the West, the center, the South, and the East. But it's really what I want to emphasize that really the, where exactly is the East ends and the West starts, kind of this divide was um, not that clear, it was quite ambiguous. I'm going to illustrate um, this point with a few slides in a minute. Um, and also very importantly that this divide between kind of pro-Western, um, more Ukrainian West and kind of more pro-Russian maybe, you know, not sort of strongly Ukrainian or kind of ambiguously Ukrainian East and center has changed over time. And this border was shifting more and more to the East. So in other words, the population of Ukraine or the group of Ukrainians who more and more thought of themselves as distinct nation favoring kind of pro-Western policies, orientation towards Europe as opposed to Russia has been growing gradually, has been growing gradually over time. So um, again, just to show a few um, illustrations, this whole narrative of Ukraine is divided country. And, you know, which again echoes some of the Putin's narrative that people in Eastern, Southern Ukraine really want to be with Russia, they're really Russian or Russian speakers. And, you know, that sort of makes them identify uh, with Russia. Um, goes back to some of the electoral maps from um, early elections in Ukraine. So this map, for example, shows the results of uh, 2010 presidential elections and the percent of population that identify Russian as their native language. And we see quite strong correlation. So here is this sort of Southwestern Ukraine uh, where you know, many people say that Russian as opposed to Ukrainian is their native language. And here is the electoral map where pro-Russian candidate Yanukovych wins in the South and the East, right? And pro-Western candidates at the time, Yulia Tymoshenko um, won in the center um, and uh, Western regions, right? So that sort of seems this very kind of stark divide. But if we look within each of these regions with a little bit more finer lens, we see that there is actually a tremendous amount of diversity in these regions. And just to bring it a little bit to contemporary developments, um, you've probably seen in the news that recently Ukrainians liberated, Ukrainian army liberated the region Kherson, which is the Southern region. That was the only regional capital uh, Putin captured. On this map, it's just um, north of Crimea. And these scenes of jubilation on the streets, you know, people greeting Ukrainian soldiers, being happy to be liberated. This is in this supposed the pro-Russian kind of half of Ukraine, right? So really very over, not to say there was nothing behind it, because clearly we see different election results and so forth. But I want to emphasize how um, identity was really much more complex, multifaceted and evolving 
right? And this is something that, again, I'll come back to this point, seems to be completely lost on the Russian leadership generally and uh, Putin specifically, right? So again, this narrative that South and Eastern Ukraine is what Putin calls New Russia, Navarasia, this imperial contrast construct, and really, you know, Russia should be first of all entitled to rule over there. And second of all, people, they're supposed to welcome this development and really neither of these things are true. So again, to show you, right, the same linguistic map, let me go back here for a second. So this blue and yellow map on the top, right, percent of population identifying Russian as the native language by the macro region. Now, if we look within, right, at the level of city, town and village councils, we see quite a different story, right? So even in the region that supposedly primarily right, Russian speaking, it's actually not even the case because what we see here, it's usually the urban centers that will be more Russian spoken, right? And in the same broader area, in the rural areas, in smaller towns, Ukrainian remains to be the language right, of choice and use. So again, kind of introduces like, are these people really Russian speaking? Are they really not? Um, another illustration of the same point, right? This is actually that blue part of Ukraine, supposedly, you know, pro-Russian, uh, Russian speaking. And again, if we kind of, take a more, more targeted lens, um, counties and cities where most residents are native speakers of Russian, we get somewhat different picture, right? And here, just looking at one of these regions, Kharkiv, which is Ukrainian second city, second largest city, and it just, right, the whole region would be colored blue on the previous map, but here we see, again, variation within the region and just two of the smaller municipalities uh, would have uh, primarily Russian language. Now, so this point of the evolution, right? So again, that's what I wanted to emphasize, how not only this identity divide in Ukraine was complex to begin with, um, it has been evolving over the years, and the evolution has been in favor of greater identification with Ukraine as a state, and the formation, what I would say, of stronger civic identity over time. So these are the numbers from the annual surveys asking people who do they identify by nationality. And as you see, there is this interesting trend that essentially every year, fewer and fewer people identify as Russian and more people identify as Ukrainian, right? Why would that be the case? One sort of maybe plausible hypothesis is to say that maybe Russians emigrated from Ukraine after 1991, right? And maybe they moved to Russia or somewhere else. And certainly there has been some migration that's undeniable, but most parts of this changes in these numbers are people who used to identify as Russian. Because for example, they were from a mixed marriage where one parent was Russian, one parent was Ukrainian. As you know, the normalcy of, of Ukrainian sovereign state continued over the years. More and more of them came to think of themselves as Ukrainian. So again, political rationale, we can say political push incentives in the Soviet period when Ukraine was not a separate state and Russian was the prestigious sort of identity and way to advance in life in the Soviet Union, that these sets of incentives change after independence and we see more and more people, including those who before would say that they were ethnic Russian and therefore certain, certainly their children begin to self-identify as Ukrainian, right? We also see growth in the people who consider their language Ukrainian to be their mother, mother tongue. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would speak it actively in daily life, but again, identity with this language uh, was growing, right? And um, the, given these different options, do you consider yourself primarily a citizen of Ukraine, resident of whatever locality you live in, local identity is still very strong in most parts of the former Soviet Union, or citizen of the Soviet Union, which is also not kind of strange identification given that everybody came out from that state, Right, many people, especially in the Soviet period, were encouraged to think of themselves as Soviet, uh, right, as not necessarily, or at least in addition to their ethnic identity. And we see this identification with a citizen of Ukraine has grow is growing, and also we see important spikes. Right, in two thousand four, there is a spike, and then again around two thousand fourteen. So I want to highlight again that these were really critical turning points when this consolidation of Ukrainian identity was becoming stronger following these political events that I'll talk about them very briefly in a second, the so-called Orange Revolution in 2004, and then Euromaidan protest in 2014, that further kind of turbo turbocharged um, this process of growing Ukrainian civic uh, political identity. So again, just to show the shift in the borders, as I was saying, kind of pro-Ukrainian identity increasing over time, this map shows a vote for pro-Western um, political candidates. And starting in 91 vote for presidential elections, when Vyacheslav Chornovil, who was sort of the best, we can say, pro-Western candidate or nationalist candidate, if you wish, at the time, only wins um, in the parts of this Western Ukraine that was part of interval Poland. 
Then by 98, the border begins to shift. 2002, it shifts further, right? 2004, it shifts further still. And here, if we look at more recent elections in 2000, 12, 2014, and finally 2019, the last set of elections, we see this kind of pro-Western parties and candidates really uh, gaining votes now much further east than certainly they did um, in the 1990s, right? So this important evolution, and none of this, and here I'm coming to the situation in Russia, none of this was really acknowledged or believed by the Russian leaders, primarily President Putin, or certainly Putin personally. He has given uh, the speeches, he has authored uh, papers um, where he claims that, you know, Ukrainians and Russians are, are one nation, that Ukraine, this artificial construct that was created by Lenin, and essentially, you know, basically Ukrainians, people were brainwashed by the West, nationalist government in Kiev, you name it, NATO, um, to believe themselves to be separate, well, really they're not, right? And again, kind of the broader logic was that if only, you know, Russians would come to Ukraine and liberate them from this junta, you would see essentially national jubilation and people would be welcoming Russian tanks. And I think that goes a lot to explaining this disastrous invasion because they did have plans to take over the country in just a matter of a few days. They came there with parade uniforms and the really ironic to me kind of you know, again, I think it goes to show the depths of um, identity convictions, this imperial identity that certain Russian leadership shares and unfortunately a good part of the Russian public, right? That is just refusing to acknowledge this reality that Ukraine has changed since 1991, changed by a lot. Putin was asked directly, what does he make of the opinion polls that show that Ukrainians favor EU membership in greater number, NATO membership? He basically said that these polls cannot be trusted, that people are afraid to show their true pro-Russian preferences, and the polls basically are falsified preference. So it is really quite um, amazing to my mind, kind of the rejection of the facts that don't fit your worldview. But by all accounts, uh, Putin did base his decision to invade in part of his understanding what Ukraine is and is not, and this understanding is profoundly wrong, um, you know, with tragic consequences um, that we see today. So again, to show you that this Imperial attitude, unfortunately, as I said, that yes, you know, Putin, of course, ordered this invasion, but um, it does resonate with many Russians who again grew up, socialized, um, and that goes back to the Tsarist period and to this narrative of unity of the three Slavic people, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, common origin, the whole thing. So if you ask, you know, people who are asked over the years, um, are Ukrainians and Russians single nation to different nations? And you see, you know, about half of the population, give or take, believes that they are essentially not different people, but the same nation, right? And again, some of the sentiment was present in Ukraine as well, but it really has changed um, over time, right? So let me say a few words about the importance, as I said, that this process um, really um, of kind of divergence between Ukrainian and Russian perceptions of self and of each other, even though it was going on for, for 30 years, since 1991, really, Get, gets turbocharged within Ukraine by these two very important events, the 2004 Orange Revolution um, and 2013 um, Euromaidan, right? And these also, these are events that essentially disrupt authoritarian or attempt to establish authoritarian regime that further Putin perceives as threatening, right? So Ukraine was not only kind of wayward child that really should have been in, in the family, but somehow gets all these crazy ideas that supposedly nationalists try to propagate, Right, but also having Ukraine go its, its, its own path and create a political model that would be different from authoritarianism that Putin creates in Russia. Many scholars have argued, and I would agree with this, does sort of threaten the type of political regime Putin created. Because if we have people overthrow authoritarian government, right, and then establish a functioning, messy as it is, but still functioning, right, democratic state with functioning economy, that creates a precedent, right? If people are so similar, why can't Russians do this? So this sort of precedent of popular mobilization, electoral um, uprising has been perceived in Russia as very, very dangerous. Again, something that has been Western meddling, right? That was not like organic civil society mobilization, but um, CIA paid the money, right? Uh, Western advisors did it, people got paid. And it's all, all aimed at weakening Russia. So that's also very... I think important difference, right? Kind of incompatibility in the domestic political sense. So just to show you, again, many of you may know that um, in Ukraine, um, unlike in Russia, leadership has been changing regularly. So Ukrainian presidents lose elections all the time. This doesn't even show in the 1990s when 
Kuchma defeated President Kravchuk in 1994, and then he himself got defeated by Yushchenko, right? Then we had Yanukovych, then Poroshenko, now finally Zelensky, so a succession of presidents. And in Russia, um, since uh, Putin comes to power, essentially anointed by Yeltsin as his um, successor, he kind of stays in power. There was this short period uh, when he and Medvedev switched places, when Medvedev became president, Putin became prime minister, and then Putin comes back um, in uh, 2012 and basically has been in power ever since. Constitution was changed last year to enable him to stay in power until um, 2036, right? So completely different political model of this essentially personalistic autocracy that really strengthened uh, since 2012 in particular, right, in stark contrast to this messy democratic, not obviously model democracy, but much more pluralistic political competition in Ukraine, right? So again, the, these two key events, 2004 Orange Revolution, when there was basically rigged presidential elections, when Yanukovych at the time was declared winner of the elections, despite massive electoral fraud, people mobilized against um, this attempt to install him as president. Uh, this mass mobilization became known as Orange Revolution, and eventually uh, the protesters succeed. There has been a revolt, and Yushchenko becomes president, um, creating sort of greater um, pluralistic political competition in the years that he was in charge, right? And then Yanukovych comes back to power in 2010, in, at that time, basically clean elections, more, more or less, and immediately he starts to consolidating his political power, he changes the constitution, to strengthen presidential rule, uh, he stacks constitutional court, arrests his main opponent um, at the election time. Kind of discontent in the society is growing, and the, really the last straw was his decision under pressure from Russia and bribe of several billion dollars at the time uh, to renege on signing the European uh, agreement with European Union on association and free trade. And that was sort of the last straw that, you know, for many Ukrainians who felt that this kind of our turning point, our last chance to go to, with Europe as opposed to be some sort of in Russian sphere of influence, people take to the streets. This protest became known as Euromaidan. Um, unlike the Orange Revolution, they eventually turn, turn violent. Dozens of protesters would be killed. But eventually, again, protests succeed. Yanukovych is thrown out. He escapes to Russia, right? And Ukraine would then, you know, sign European and free trade agreement and sort of orient itself towards Europe. And Putin again perceives it as some sort of ploy, as a coup, as Western meddling, all of it aimed at weakening Russia, right? So um, to just, um, you know, to speed up a little bit so we can get to the uh, situation uh, currently. So this process that I was talking about of consolidation of Ukrainian identity, it becoming more distinctly pro-Western, pro-Ukrainian, picks up um, after 2014 substantially. <clears throat> Here is the... Um, support for membership in the EU, which was always a little bit more popular in Ukraine, kind of even more or less not somewhat more popular. We really see right a spike much greater now majority, very clear majority in support of the EU as opposed to Russia led um, against the EU and be some sort of part of Russia led political alliance. And maybe even more importantly, support for NATO. Uh, I'll come to the point about NATO uh, next, because, uh, you know, this narrative that basically Putin starts this war against Ukraine because NATO was going to expand to Ukraine and that was a threat to Russia is wrong on many accounts. But what's interesting, before we even get to that, is how attitude to NATO changed within Ukraine. Up until 2014, minority of people supported NATO membership. So any even hypothetical referendum on Ukraine joining NATO would have failed. But after 2014, after annexation of Crimea, start of the war in Donbass, we see this dramatic increase in support. And of course, that further accelerates after February invasion. So any kind of referendum for NATO now would pass where it would not have passed before. And Ukraine actually formally applied for membership in NATO, which it didn't do before. So I would say before the invasion, Ukrainian membership in NATO would have essentially been impossible. But now, I mean, again, not to say it necessarily will happen, but I think it certainly becomes more likely, ironically, because of Putin's actions aimed at preventing it, right? Um, then. Uh, before the invasion. And the, here, just to show that this attitude to NATO, um, actually now support for NATO is strong in the regions that were historically more Russia friendly, which is really quite ironic. When we think of the East and the South, yes, the percentages are a little bit smaller, but still majority of population supports membership in NATO in the EU in this historical Russian region. And that's completely a result of Putin's aggressive action against Ukraine starting in 2014. That would have never happened. It was just never there. So again, really quite some irony, right? So, uh, so talking about right this um, 
incompatibility in foreign policy orientation. So Ukraine pursued through the 1990s, early 2000s, foreign policy that its former president Kuchma characterized as quote unquote multivectoral. So sort of trying to keep you know, friendly relations with different poles, but at the same time, also European and Euro-Atlantic integration was declared as a goal, um, sort of longer term goal. Um, for, for Ukraine as far as foreign policy, right? And Russian uh, attitude and relations with NATO really soured. So again, this whole narrative, let me talk a little bit about the NATO thing because I think it's important, right? NATO has expanded to former parts um, of the communist bloc, originally to countries in East Central Europe, right? And then also to the countries that were part of the former Soviet Union, like the Baltic states, right? And Ukraine and Georgia declared their uh, desire to be in NATO. Not surprisingly, Russia did not like this, but to say that NATO expansion um, you know, was the cause of this war, I think is problematic for a variety of reasons. First of all, because it basically denies even the agency of, this, of these countries. It's not that NATO was expanding kind of against the will of these countries. The countries such as Poland, the Baltic countries were begging to be let in given the experience with Russian imperialism. Now with Ukraine, it was more complicated because there was no appetite in NATO for inviting Ukraine. So they, yes, declared in light of you know, international principles, each country can make its sovereign decisions on alliances that Ukraine theoretically has a right to be in NATO. But as far as it being any kind of practical possibility, it was completely a non-starter. Germany was against it, France was against it, Orban and Hungary could have reliably vetoed it. So this idea that sort of NATO expansion to Ukraine, and as I said, within Ukraine, there was no support, was really imminent, I think is completely not supported. Um, by the evidence. Furthermore, this whole narrative that Ukraine, that NATO really was a security threat to Russia, I think has been contradicted further since the start of the war, because of course, since the war started, Finland and Sweden declared the intention to be in NATO, and Putin is not too concerned about that. Not only that, he actually withdrew Russian troops from this border of enlarging NATO um, and moved them, you know, to fight in Ukraine. So I think, you know, again, not to say that, you know, NATO was completely relevant, because clearly, Putin did not like NATO, but it was more again sort of this idea that in what he perceives as backyard, as Russian, you know, the territory where Russia has the right to control this, you know, its sphere of influence, that these countries would dare to declare some other political alliances or preferences, right? Like this agency of these countries was, was really questioned, not so much kind of hard security, I would argue. I, I know not everybody agrees with this position, but I think at least among scholars, that's really... Um, I would say kind of increasingly there's a consensus that this whole narrative of, you know, Russia going to war to prevent the security threat from NATO is not really well supported. And these are some of the key points, right? So, so moving on to the actual right war and what, you know, what is happening, what might come. This map shows um, where Russia originally, Russian forces um, originally were present. So as you probably know, but just by following the news, um, the goal was to overthrow Nazi government in Kyiv, to have some sort of puppet government from what we know, um, and, and really the expectation that it could be done very quickly, that you know Ukrainians would welcome the Russian troops. Um, Russian troops um, came to Ukraine with parade uniforms, and the whole operation, as it's called special operation, military operation in Russia, was supposed to last I mean, by some accounts, three days, seven days, really short. Now, of course, we are now in the ninth month of the war. Um, you know, Russia has been kicked out of all of these territories north in the north and the east by Ukrainian armed forces with the military support from, from the west. And most recently, um, Kherson, right in the south, um, where um, the Russians were forced to withdraw across the Dnipro River and um, the only regional capital that they have captured um, since the start of the invasion is now back in Ukrainian hands and fighting continues in the East. And I think it is quite possible, right, that uh, I'll come to this in a second, that there may be more, um, uh, you know, more, more territorial losses for Russia. Um, the war is not really going great, uh, great for them. Now, this, um, you know, this resistance of Ukrainians, I think it's important to realize, because again, this is not something that Putin expected. These are people, you know, in Kherson, in the southern region, where on this the, the the map of the two halves of Ukraine were in the pro-Russian uh, half of Ukraine, supposedly. So they're protesting here against, you know, Russian forces. And really to understand this, I think this evolution of identity is key. Because for Ukrainians, this war is really seen as an existential fight for survival. Like either we survive as the nation and the people, or we don't. And this is why we see such, an, such a determination to fight, the will to fight no, you know, almost no societal support for any kind of concession, even despite the current 
bombings of the infrastructure and essentially terror against the civilian population. So just to show you that, I mean, you'll you all again know it in the news, the systematic war crimes, right? The, the brutality of the Russian occupation, them going out individually, people they consider to be, you know, two pro-Ukrainian activists and torturing and killing them, kidnapping the children, right? The, destroying cultural school textbooks, um, language textbooks, history textbooks. So for the Ukrainians, this idea that we can give some territory and have peace not only Russia is not trusted for good reasons, because Russia has violated essentially all the agreements that, that had signed um, with Ukraine on recognition of borders, the so-called Budapest memorandum that was actually just anniversary with yesterday when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in return for security guarantees, that to leave you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Ukrainians to this brutality of Russian occupation is just not an option. So we see that. Right, the you know this famous um, quote from one of the addresses, nightly addresses of President Zelensky, when he really tells Putin, "Read my lips, without lights so or without you, without you, without food or without you, without you." So really, this driving home that there is no sort of possibility for any kind of vassalization by Russia, and Putin, of course, you know, continues uh, to insist that you know the government is somehow not representing Ukrainian government, not representing the interests of the Ukrainian people. To show you with opinion polls what this means, right? This, um, the, first of all, Ukrainians are very optimistic that they can actually win. We don't really have time. I mean, I'm not going to go over the, like, the details what happens on the battlefield, but the Russian army is not doing all that great. They have all these problems with supplies, mobilization. It was widely reported daily almost in American news. So I'm assuming everybody knows this, right? But this, you know, optimism that, you know, people are not only sure that Ukraine can win, more and more people over time express this confidence that Ukraine can prevail in this war, right? Even after Russia started bombing uh, Ukrainian cities and in civilian infrastructure, when people are asked, um, should we continue armed resistance, even if shelling of the cities continue, or should we start negotiations to end the shelling, essentially give, you know, something, you know, as you can see from this, you know, from this poll, most people remain committed to resistance and don't see, don't think giving into Russia is a good idea. And again, this attitude, is not completely uniform across regions, but majorities in each region can support continued resistance, even despite uh, Russian terror tactics, right? Now, going to sort of what the possibility for the settlement, I think from what I was saying before, it's probably now, um, you're not surprised that my, um, you know, my prediction, if you want to say that, I mean, not really prediction, but kind of analysis of where things stand, is that negotiated settlement is very unlikely exactly because of this incompatibility of the goals of Russia and Ukraine, that Ukrainians essentially want to be free and live in their own separate state, and free Ukraine, independent Ukraine, that could do what, what it feels, what its people choose to do, is considered mortal threat for Russians, right? For, for Russian leadership and all its pundits and sort of this narrative that, you know, truly sovereign Ukraine that can choose its foreign policy orientation is somehow like a stab to the heart of Russia is there, Putin has not modified any of his maximalist goals. So you sometimes hear this narrative, all oh, Ukrainians are not willing to negotiate, but like negotiate over what? Putin has not modified any of his goals. He is not offering to give up any of the territory that they seized. And again, given what happens on the territories that they occupy, how population is brutalized, how war crimes are committed, right? This, I think, you know, from the ability, the possibility that there could be some kind of negotiated settlement, I think, at least in the short term, is not likely. I think we are likely to see continuation of the military fighting. And um, I think Russian military defeat is is, is probable. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But really, when we think about it, we have, I'm happy to go more into this point in the q and I think time is not on Russia's side for a variety of reasons, with having to do with international sanctions, with domestic pressures, with sort of lack of resources for effective mobilization. Yes, they have more people, but it's not sort of a question of simpler numbers. I mean, they had more people and more weapons and more guns when the invasion started. And this is why, you know, many some Western analysts expected, just given this mass, that, you know, Russian victory is kind of inevitable, and that's not where we are nine months from now, and I don't think that's where the trajectory is going, right? And then what really would happen if, say, Russia is defeated militarily, what would post-conflict post settlement would look like? I think a lot of it depends on what would happen in Russia itself. And that's a big question mark, because as many experts of Russia that we have, you know, in this country and, you know, in academia more generally, I don't think we have very good understanding how that Russian regime really works. Yes, Putin is in control, but how sort of firm that control is, and if Putin were to fall for whatever reason, what would come afterwards? It could be anything 
from hypothetically some sort of democratic transition, or it could be chaos, or it could be another autocrat, potentially even worse than Putin. I don't know if there is such a thing, right, coming to power. So I think the, you know, I would say that the type of engagement that the West in particular would be doing with Russia um, after the war should depend, you know, on what happens in Russia. If at least indeed there is democratic, some sort of democratization, then probably re-engagement would be in order after war crimes are prosecuted, after reparations are paid, you know, Russia could maybe be integrated back into a kind of civilized world. But if we don't see domestic transition in Russia and we potentially see either continuation of Putin, which is certainly possible he could remain in power in Russia, even if he were to lose in Ukraine or some sort of other form of autocracy, then I would say, I think Russia needs to be isolated because it's really a danger. I mean, when we think about it, right, the idea that you can go invading your neighbor brandishing nuclear weapons. We haven't talked about nuclear, certainly happy to talk about in q and I don't think nuclear war is upon us. I think that's that's not going to happen, but that you know. But to basically allow somebody using these methods, it really undermines world peace as we know it, undermines stability. Imagine precedent it would set for other autocrats if Putin can get away with it and then be invited back in the you know family of civilized nations. So I'll end here uh, because I think um, well, maybe just last thing that I'll show that if, you know, I'm certainly happy to take questions now, but, um, you know, if you want to help Ukraine, I am including here on the slide a few resources sort of what one could do. I think continuing to encourage your representatives um, to provide military and humanitarian support is very important. Um, weapons do save lives. So even, you know, I used to be kind of quite pacifist and this is not, you know, this war changed my views on this profoundly. And this is also what, you know, Ukrainians keep asking for more weapons because it does save lives. It prevents human human rights violations. Uh, but then again, there are also other ways to help for humanitarian support. You know, there are very respectable US-based charities. There are, you know, Ukrainian organizations that work on medical schools and so forth. And finally, I'm including also here a link uh, to the resources, more resources on the conflict that you could use to learn more about anything from history to culture to current events that the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, which is our local research organization at Harvard, focused on Ukrainian studies, put together on their website. So I'm including the link here. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, so I don't know how it's supposed to work. Do you want me to look Thank at you. the Q? Yes, um, if you are able to see the Q&A um, function at mm -hmm. the bottom of your screen, um, you may see some open questions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to read them to you if that's helpful, and um, I can kind of check them off as we go. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah, I can actually open them. I can see them, right? Um, should I stop the screen share? Yeah, let me maybe do that. Um, hold on. Okay, so um, yeah, so the first question that I see is about the attacks inside Russia uh, by the Ukrainians yesterday and today. Yes, I think, I mean, first of all, I was kind of very <laughs> shocked to put it mildly when you see New York Times headline something to the effect that like Ukraine escalates the war. I mean, the, these were military targets that were bombed, right? Like how is that an escalation when Russia has been shelling civilian infrastructure? But you know, that aside, I think it goes to my point that I was making. I don't think Russia has a path to victory. I think the situation in the Russian military is not great, to put it mildly. And now if Ukrainians are actually able to hit military targets um, in Russia, I think, if anything, it could only serve to accelerate uh, you know, Russian military defeat. So I, I guess, broadly say, I would think, I think this is a positive development. Again, I think the fact that Ukrainians targeted these strategic bombing sites, they're not targeting you know, heating facilities or hospitals or any of that. Um, so I think that's... Um, I don't know, positive development, I guess I would say. Um, another question that I see here is about Stalin expelling most of the Crimean Tatars. Yes, so that's actually a very important um, question with Crimea, because some and arguments are often heard that like, yes, okay, maybe Ukraine can regain its territory, but really Crimea is different, right? Crimea was always part of Russia, like, you know, they have strong attachment to it, like we have to give Putin at least Crimea, or he's going to nuke us all, right? I think it's a very problematic argument, um, although I also think there could be a different solution for Crimea. Let me talk about briefly about both of these. So Crimea was used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, right? So when Russian Empress um, Catherine II uh, conquers Crimea, that's when this persecution of Crimean Tatars who consider themselves indigenous to Crimea begins. So at that point, many of them are exiled already under Catherine. 
And then Stalin in 1944 essentially accuses the entire nation of collaboration with the Nazis, which is really kind of despicable and historically inaccurate. Crimean Tatar men, many were serving in the Soviet army, but Stalin essentially deports en masse all the Crimean Tatar population, primarily women and children, who were in Crimea in 1944 in these very inhumane conditions to Central Asia. By different historical accounts, up to half of the population dies um, in the, during and immediately after the deportation. They are not allowed to come back until 1989 to return to Crimea, Gorbachev, you know, only on the Gorbachev they're able to come in. Right. And then when Khrushchev transfers this Crimea to Russia, yes, part of it was, we can say, symbolic. It was an anniversary of the signing of the so called Treaty of Pereyaslav, when again, it was really an alliance that a hetman, a leader of the Ukrainian Cossacks at the time, signs with the Russian Tsar. In then imperial and Soviet historiography, it was marked as a unity, quote unquote, of you know, Russia and Ukraine. But that aside, so there was this symbolic kind of historical date. But also very important to know that Crimea was really economically dependent on the Ukrainian Republic. All the water to Crimea, electricity and all of this was coming to the Ukrainian mainland. So from the purposes of administering the peninsula, it actually made sense, you know, that transfer back in 1954, um, that when Khrushchev does that. Now, since then, you know, as I was saying, Crimea was the only ethnic majority Russian region. Once the Tatars were deported, Soviet retirees, military, settled in Crimea in the homes that from which the Tatars were kicked out, which created really quite conservative kind of almost like Stalinist constituency in Crimea, a lot of this military conservative retirees. So we have like really very different sets of attitudes. Now, all that said, through the 1990s and 2000s, basically until 2014, Ukrainian central government and Crimean elites were able to find a compromise. So this sort of demands for greater autonomy and threatening to succeed and all of this was going on with Crimea and Ukraine since 1990, even before formal independence. And invariably, until you know, when Russia was not intervening, a compromise was found. So Crimea actually had a status of autonomy within Ukraine. They had greater rights that other regions didn't have, including for language, right? And Crimean Tatars you know, wanted also greater rights for themselves, that this Russian-speaking majority was not willing to give them because the Soviet stereotype that Crimean Tatars are somehow Nazi collaborators was unfortunately very strong among many Russian Crimeans. So what I'm guess driving at here, that if you know sort of, first of all, Crimea obviously legally is part of Ukraine just as any other region. So sort of from the international legal standpoint to say that it's somehow separate doesn't really fly. Now that said, I also don't really see Ukrainian army kind of fighting village by village to go liberate Crimea, right? Before the invasion, the percent of people who wanted to be part of Russia and Crimea has declined quite a bit. I think it was about 30% in 2013 before Putin annexed it. Of course, you know, it's likely higher now. And certainly, you know, some Russians came from Russia. So anyways, what I'm trying to say that if it came to that, like if, say, you know, uh, Putin was able, you know, was willing to concede other things, but there were some sort of, you know, what, what do we do about Crimea? I think Ukrainians might be open. I don't think they want to say that publicly, although Zelensky did hint at that, to some sort of third way, right? Like some temporary international protectorate, the militarized zone, sort of like the Hong Kong of, um, you know, of, of Ukraine, right? So I don't think that's really an, um, how to say it, like um, insurmountable obstacle to eventually ending this war, right? But I think letting Putin the next Crimea would really be a problem just sort of legally say, okay, you capture it, you keep it. Because think of what the precedent it creates, right? I think that's really when we're thinking about danger for peace, this, you know, having the war of aggression to reward the aggressor with a bit of territory, you know, citing all this history, everybody can cite some history. I mean, the Turks can say Crimea is really ours. You know, you can find Ukrainian historians who are gonna tell you who settled then Khersonesk, when the prince was baptized in 1100 something rather. I mean, it's this argument sort of who has the correct historical claim really goes, I think, nowhere, right? But that I think would be um, things I would keep in mind when we think about Crimea and possible settlement. So I think that covers it, at least what I can tell. Um, the Okay, the question about how weapons save lives uh, from anonymous attendee. Why don't they, right? I mean, look at what Russia has been doing. It brutalizes the population. So every town that Ukrainians liberate, that the life saved in that village, right? In that town, in that region. So the more, you know, the quicker Ukraine can kick Russians out of this territory, the more people are saved. I think that's as simple as that, right? Given what happens under occupation, I don't think there is an argument to be made that somehow, you know, 
having Russia give it more land and stop the fighting would really save lives. So that's my you know, opinion. And I imagine some others might disagree. <clears throat> what are people uh, who live in Russia hearing about the war? They're not hearing anything, you know, um, any view other than the official view on any of the official channels, because media is completely under control. So any large audience media, um, they are basically hearing this bloodthirsty, for lack of a better word, narrative, how, again, the Nazis are running Ukraine, how, you know, they, they're terrible and basically people need to be liberated. But actually, it's not no longer even that. That was the original narrative that Ukrainians need to be liberated. Now it is that they need to be re-educated. And if they don't want to be re-educated, they need to be killed. It is really quite scary. I encourage you, if you're interested, um, Julia Davis runs this web website called Russian Media Monitor. When she goes through the task, I don't know how she finds the nerve, but she basically watches Russian state TV and does summaries with English subtitles of what is actually on the Russian TV channels on the prime time. And it's really quite scary. So if you go again, it's Julia Davis, uh, Russian media monitor. So you can see the message they're getting. Do Russians have access to alternative sources of information? Yes, they do, because the internet is quite widespread. Uh, you can get VPN to access the websites that are blocked in Russia. So if somebody is interested in getting alternative information, it could be accessed without too much difficulty. Now, unfortunately, given the polls that we have as far as support for the war within Russia, it seems the majority is either actively supports it or at least doesn't actively oppose it. So this argument that like if only Russian people had different information, they may feel about this war differently, possibly, but I think the evidence is not fully sort of convincing, right? given again, potential availability. Um, so, Okay, um, can you comment on noises that seem to be coming from Republican? Yes, yes, that is, um, again, I think that's very unfortunate. Um, so again, when I'm saying if you do want to help, you know, Ukraine, I think urging maybe your relatives in other states where there are Republican representatives, you know, to write to them and urge them to continue supporting Ukraine, Ukrainians would appreciate it. Yeah. Luckily, I mean, again, my take on it is that Ukrainian, uh, that Republican party is divided on this issue. So it's not that like entire Republican party wants to basically <laughs> stop supporting Ukraine and is hesitant to criticize Putin or try to praise Putin, All right? Uh, Tucker Carlson is, gets quoted on this Russian media, you know, state TV channels all the time. Um, so I think I remain somewhat optimistic that I think these voices within the Republican Party that, you know, take this position that Danielle is asking, I don't think they'll carry the day. But that certainly creates, you know, potentially get, maybe getting aid is going to be a little bit harder, right? you know, whatever Biden may want to do if they start investigation against Biden. It may not be specifically about Ukraine, but sort of distracts the attention, right? So I think um, that's something to, to be aware of, right? Even though I don't think that's going to be detrimental danger. Um, what happens if people in the United States elect president who is more friendly to Russia? Uh, yeah, I don't know what happens. Like, it seems, you know, it's kind of ironic, right? Because in the, now the Republicans seem to be more friendly to Russia. Um, and, you know, of course, Trump as a Republican president was, you know, friendly to Russia. Historically, of course, it was the opposite, right? The Republicans were sort of the anti-communist hawks and it was like the Democrats who were more like accommodating the Soviet Union. Um, but, you know, even when Trump was president, like, yes, I think a lot of damage was done, kind of, you know, things that could have been done were not done. But ultimately, he was not able to really they support Putin wholeheartedly, right? So I think even if the president is friendly towards Russia, the balance in Congress, right, the divisions within the Republican Party, you know, that this sort of overtly pro-Russian agenda, I think even for a president that may have personal preference this way, I think maybe harder to implement uh, than some hope or fear. I don't think it will be a great thing, uh, but, you know, again, I don't think it uh, would mean that US policy would become pro-Russian. It just seems hard to imagine. Um, so dangerous to see um, Putin using foreign fighters from Syria. Yes, they've been using foreign fighters from different countries already. It seems like it hasn't made that much of a difference. We've, we've had talks about, you know, fighters from Syria, from Central African Republic, from, you know, the Chechens, of course. Um, it seems like, again, given how things have been going for Russia on the battlefield, which is not great, um, they advanced in recent months, like incrementally, Take a look at recently was I saw something that took like 80 days to capture one village in Donbass. I don't think these fighters are gonna make um big difference. So that's what I would say. Um 
would uh, Putin use nuclear, nuclear weapons if he's put in the corner? I don't think so. Of course, you know, nobody can predict these things for sure. And of course, everybody wants to avoid nuclear war. Um, but like he has nothing to gain by doing this, right? Like what would he possibly gain? Any kind of tactical nuclear weapon uh, on the battlefield? Um, again, from what I've read by military experts, they seem to be in agreement that it's not going to help Russia turn the course of war. It would really be crossing the kind of threshold that Putin has not crossed before. Again, I can only say what I've seen in the media that there have been behind the scenes communications with Putin from Western leaders, including US leaders, that this is not where he wants to go. He is not suicidal. He really wants to, you know, preserve himself, his power. So I don't think it seems like again, from you know, based on what media was reporting, that this message registered. And in a way, this is why we see this attacks on civilian infrastructure that intensified in recent months since October, because within Russia, again, if we are to believe this press reports that following this behind the scene talks and warnings from Western leaders and kind of realization that militarily he has nothing to gain by trying to use nuclear weapons, that that idea has been abandoned. And now the new strategy is the civilian destruction of infrastructure to put pressure on the population, supposedly would then put pressure on Zelensky to capitulate and sign some agreement. It's not working, but that's sort of, you know, again, from what I read, um, the nuclear development um, has taken this course recently. Um, so time is not on the Russian side, European support um, going down. Yes, this is also certainly has been, you know, and it still is, is today, I think, um, a big hope, um, maybe to somewhat less extent, but certainly has been the hope in, in the Putin government, part of their calculus, that the Europeans, because they're dependent on Russian energy and oil and gas and all of this, and that they, you know, historically some, you know, the UK is always kind of more hawkish and France and Italy and Germany, right, are more Russia friendly, that there would be this divide in Europe, right, and then they're going to freeze. There are some really cringy Russian propaganda videos showing about all these freezing European women going to Moscow to like hang out with some Russian guy who's said his underwear and his warm apartment is like really quite um, sad. But I mean, I think if we look at actually what's happening, that's not what happened. Um, Europe has prepared for the winter, they filled their gas storages. If we look at the opinion polls, the public support for supporting Ukraine has not dwindled. If anything, if you think kind of over the long term, right, this breaking dependency on the Russian energy, which before the West Europeans were not planning on doing at all, if anything, they were increasing it by building this North Stream 2 pipeline, which has now been shelved. And I think Russia kind of lost, again, talking about shooting themselves in the foot, in the foot, I think lost the leverage, or is, or is going to lose the leverage it had with the Europeans. So again, not to say that there isn't a variation in public opinion and there is some dissatisfaction, but at least to date, based you know, on the polls and the analysis that I've seen, I think this conclusion or you know, fear that the West European publics are going to sort of abandon you know, support for Ukraine because it's you know, too cold in the apartments so or prices are too high just doesn't seem to be happening. Um, so about the brain drain of young, talented Russians leaving to avoid the draft. Yes, I think that's another you know, way in which Putin shooting himself in the foot. I mean, the demographic situation in Russia has been dire to begin with, with you know, low life expectancy, especially for men, high alcoholism, like you know, low birth rate, all of these things that were there you know, for the last 30 years, even though Russia became richer and the Putin's rule, higher oil prices, sort of all this largesse, this kind of human dimension has not really improved from medicine to education, you know, to life expectancy. And yes, and now we see more of this. I think they, you know, by different accounts, it's in the hundreds of thousands of young Russians who left, right, Russia, who may not, you know, certainly not come back as, as long as the war is going on and they, there is fear that they will be drafted. Um, obviously, you know, Russia is taking Ukrainian children and some Ukrainian civilians forcefully or by tricking them into Russia. We don't really know sort of the extent of it fully. It's clearly massive, but no, nobody really knows. Some say that that's actually part of the demographic policy, which would be you know, scary to think about it. So on the one hand, yes, they're losing people who are evading draft. But then again, if you're taking these Ukrainians and the children and placing them for adoption with Russian families, right? If this is really part of the demographic calculus, I mean, that's when sort of charges of gen genocide begin, begin to come in. I mean, there is a debate and discussion among scholars whether Russian war crimes in Ukraine meet the criteria threshold for genocide, and many scholars believe that it does, especially the sort of forceful removal of the uh, children of the group. Uh, but yes, so the, the brain loss, I think, uh, is having you know an impact um, longer term. Um, Backers of Navalny do not have any influence now, unfortunately. They basically have been, you know, exiled. 
they are um, abroad. Um, they have a lot of disagreements among themselves. They recently tried to hold some kind of Congress in Poland that they called themselves like a new Russian parliament, sort of claiming that, you know, the parliament in Russia is not legitimate because it was not elected democratically and they're going to have this other parliament. And immediately on social media, these different opposition figures are like, who are you to call yourself a representative who voted for you? Like you don't represent anybody. So this idea that again, you know, as long as Putin remains in power, some form of authoritarian rule as he, that he established stays, I think Russian opposition does not really have much influence. So, I mean, they may have more influence, you know, again, if there is some sort of political transition in Russia and Navalny is out of jail and all of these things. But I think at this point, um, that just is not there. Um, so Sachs uh, on democracy. Um, Okay, so he's admitted the negotiated settlement that we need to keep up dialogue between the two countries, give Crimea historical Russian and perhaps Sudan bus area, uh, provide security for development. Well, I, I, I just don't think either of, like none of these things are really realistic and workable because again, negotiated settlement, um, as I was saying, so Putin gave no intention that he, you know, has any plans to give up anything they annexed formally and changed the constitution, these regions that they seized. They try to seize Kyiv and they may well try again. Any agreement that Russia signed before it violated. So this idea that we can somehow have a negotiated settlement and that, you know, again, Putin can be trusted, um, I think is misplaced, right? For Crimea, I already talked about, I think this argument that is historical or any, any region in any country, potentially historically, you know, somebody has better claim to it. I think that's really a path to nowhere. I think Ukrainians can be expected to, to treat Crimea somewhat differently, say in language policy, because it's majority Russian, you know, population and predominantly Russian speaking. But it actually can do that even within the current political framework, because Crimea has a status of autonomy within Ukraine that other regions don't have. So even before annexation and all of this, there was kind of different approach. And it was a long time messy negotiation. A good book is actually written about this negotiating autonomy for Crimea by Gwendolyn Sasse. So um, I think the idea that, you know, an aggressor state could be rewarded with a chunk of territory because they're gonna say we have historical claim to it. I think that's a very dangerous precedent. So I don't think that's a good proposal. And for Donbass it's even less so. I mean, yes, that region had also a lot of Russian speakers, but again, you know, Ukrainians always found a compromise. There was after 2004 Re Orange Revolution that I was mentioning, there was actually an attempt to establish successionist Southeastern Ukrainian People's Republic or something like this by the elites who lost in the presidential race. And it went nowhere. In other words, there was a compromise, there was negotiation between central and regional elites, there was some sort of power sharing, <laughs> and things worked out then up until Russia invaded. So. Sachs, I know, has his views, but I think he's wrong on all these accounts. Um, so um, I don't know. Alexander Dugin, how much it's, I think if you're asking about Dugin, it's spelled as Dugan, but I think that's Dugin, right? Uh, on Putin, the one who is sort of this Russian nationalist. That is actually debated. I don't have a good answer to that. I have um, I've known people who work on sort of Russian nationalist movements more specifically, and they seem themselves to be in a disagreement. Some scholars say that Dugin has a lot of influence and essentially he kind of says what Putin believes, only he doesn't have any qualms of saying some things that sound really crazy. Um, and others say that Dugin is really this marginal character that he's not, you know, particularly influential. But I think either, regardless which one of these things is true, I think the, the narrative, right, of these Ukrainians are really being Russians historically, biologically, you know, God-given, whatever, intent, Right, and any, anything sort of other than that um, is somehow false and unnatural. And Russia is entitled by virtue of being a great power to, you know, sphere of influence, to control territory, to dominate in its neighborhood. I think that is very much shared by Russian elites sort of, and Putin without Dugin. He is also fond of various other Russian imperial historians from early 20th century who, who have written kind of more or less the same narrative. Uh, so that would be, you know, as I would say on the Dugin. Um, how confident are you that Western support for Ukraine will stay strong throughout the cold of the coming winter? Uh, why do you believe support will stay strong? Um, so let me see. Is the question about um, uh, Western support or Western support for Ukraine? I think it's sort of similar to the question I had before, right? I mean, um, as again, I said, I think in part because um, in Western Europe, they prepared for this winter well. Um, they have, you know, gas storage is full, all of these things that, you know, this idea that Europeans will be freezing in their homes um, 
it just seems like it's sort of Russian wishful thinking. It's not going to happen. If anything, we could say like, what about next winter, right? If the war still goes on, right? And say now, you know, Europeans receive less of Russian gas. Are there some other ways for say Germany to fill in its gas storages uh, before next winter, right? Like that, I don't really know. I think that's something to sort of, you know, keep in mind. But I think for this winter, and again, for what we see of the support, and I think this general, you know, Europeans, you know, no, no not the far right, of course, but, or the far left for that matter. But I think, you know, Europeans understand what it is. It is an imperial war of conquest, right? Like Ukrainians are clearly a victim here. This is not sort of like, there is no really way to two-side this particular conflict. There are many conflicts that we can sort of two-side it. Well, these people did something bad. Those people did something bad. It's complicated right, like civil war, so forth. But here it's like so clear, I mean, I think, and I think for many Europeans see that. So I, you know, like I think we can see some obviously deb debates within European society, should we do this, should we do that? Like should Ukrainians keep living for free and you know, whatever housing they have, should they be expected to pay? I mean, we see some of that going on in Poland, but as far as like removing support, right? I don't think that is very likely, right? Um, I just want to, um... Uh, with respect to your time, thank you so much for all the questions you're answering. Um, we are going to stop accepting questions. So questions okay. asked after um, uh, we can we can pause yeah, on so quite, that you, you've got a few, quite a few. So, so I'll more, let you keep you going. I just wanted to give you a little relief there. That yeah, we yeah, we will actually, stop I after I questions. Soon, but um, yeah, I can I can yeah. you know try to answer a few more that, that are here. Sure. Thank but you. Um, so. Does Greece and Greek Orthodox Church factor as reliable revenue support for Ukraine? I don't know much about Greek Orthodox Church. I mean, but I do would mention, um, so that may not be sort of fully satisfactory answer, but I would mention that in Ukraine, actually part of this identity consolidation process that I talked about was actually the establishment of an independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church. So Ukrainians are Orthodox, and up until 2019, the uh, church that was independent from Moscow was considered non-canonical. In other words, it was not recognized. And the reason for it goes back to 14th century. I'm not even going to try to go there. But basically, so these attempts to establish independent Ukrainian church have been, um, you know, not successful. So Yushchenko tried in 2008, he failed. And then after 2013 and the first round of Russian invasion with Crimea, this sort of impetus for, you know, part of, having separate identities, having, you know, independent church, picked up speed. Um, the Constantinople patriarch, um, Bartholomew, came on board, so Ukrainian president at the time was very strong in favor, and this uh, new structure called Orthodox Church of Ukraine, it's very confusing, there is Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is under Moscow control, it's essentially patriarch in Moscow is its, you know, de facto head, and then this uh, or Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is this new formation um, that recognized that was recognized and was given a Thomas like a document of autocephaly by the ecumenical patriarch. And the recognition of this new church by other Orthodox churches is important because basically the pro-Russian church wants to continue to insist that these, these people are schismatics, they're not real church, you know, and look, nobody recognized them. So when Greek Orthodox Church actually recognized the legitimacy of this Ukrainian, the new um, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, that was a big deal. So that was sort of something that I think gave, you know, a boost uh, to the church itself, but also to this narrative that like, look, we actually have this established, you know, traditional long-standing Orthodox churches, seeing this, you know, Ukrainian Orthodox church as their partner and they're equal and not as some kind of schismatics. So I think in that sense, that's really the only thing I can say um, about the Greek Orthodox church that I think important role it played. Um, Survival of Ukraine's critical uh, democracy worldwide. Yes, I agree. Um, I may not have made this point very eloquently, but I think that's absolutely true. Um, so what is the most critical need um, that um, Americans can do to help assist Ukraine? Right. I mean, again, I think, I know, I imagine not everybody in the audience agrees. I think military military help is so important, right? Like not to say, you know, if that's against your principles and you want to donate to humanitarian causes, we are thankful for that as well, people in Ukraine. But really, I mean, Putin needs to be stopped. I mean, this is there is no kind of settlement negotiation that would protect Ukrainian lives, that would preserve democracy in Europe, right? That would preserve this international order where countries don't get invaded by their neighbors who denied them the right to existence. So I think, you know, uh, providing Ukrainians with the weapons, especially air defense, they're asking, I'm not a military expert, but I know Ukrainian government was asking for specific type of weaponry, patriots or something else that US government was sort of seems to be kind of reluctant to give. 
And we've seen this pattern that's first, you know, only anti-aircraft, uh, anti-tank weapons were given, right? And like the US would give nothing else. Um, and then, you know, they gave them more weapons and all these weapons are put to good use. And, you know, yes, there is monitoring and all of this. So I would say, you know, to this question, the most critical need. And again, if you ask Ukrainians, this is what you hear, right? Like give us these weapons that, you know, that the military is asking that they prove that they can use them. They make a difference. Yes, they do save lives because people who are liberated from Russian occupation, they're not getting brutalized anymore, right? And the more territory is liberated quicker, so that the sooner this disaster for people in these territories ends and the sooner reconstruction can begin. So that would be my answer to this. Um, but would Putin actually concede to give up because he's losing, right? Like, yes, this is a good question, right? Like, what might the end look like? Again, nobody can predict it. Um, and I sort of, broadly speaking, I think could envisage two possibilities. One is sort of these more kind of incremental territorial gains from Ukraine, because exactly like how they, uh, you know, all these problems with the Russian army, with mobilization, right, with the sanctions that they can't get their Western parts, that they, you know, depleting their stock of missiles, there is no no motivation and morale, they're recruiting prisoners, they're bringing, you know, fighters from Syria or whatever, right, sort of kind of like Second World War scenario, essentially, right, so it's going to take potentially more months before, you know, Ukraine liberates territory kind of in this gradual way. Now, to me, it seems like it may not be the most likely, and what might be more likely is that um, there would be another kind of breakthrough, like similar to what we saw in the east, in Kharkiv region in the beginning of the fall, where sort of quickly substantial part of territory is liberated. And if that happens, that might create a processes within Russia that basically sort of house of cards begins to collapse, because there are a lot of tensions and sort of stresses in the Russian regime. And if they were to lose, for example, Luhansk People's Republic, right, the whole narrative that Putin started this war with, that they're liberating this self-proclaimed separatist entities that were created, you know, by Russians to begin with, right? Imagine Luhansk Falls. Ukrainian army is not that far away from Luhansk, which is a regional capital in this um, northeastern, you know, region. And that's, you know, actually heard um, some Ukrainian um, intelligence expert talking about it. And to me, it sounded convincing that they're basically saying another one or two of these instances, right, may basically create, you know, the process within Russia that is army could collapse, right? Like if its army collapses, can regime really stay in power with sort of collapse of the army, right? Or if Putin sees, you know, the, that that's where it's going, could he then agree to actually get out of the territory and maybe try to negotiate over Crimea or something like that, right? I don't think it's super likely, but I think this the, the, the scenario whereby another one or two of Ukrainian military successes, right, would then start this chain reaction within Russia, is possible, right? Or it could be a long grind. I think that's also possible. So that would be my answer. Um, the imposing the cost of oil, uh, $60 a barrel, yes. Again, I'm not an expert in energy politics. If you are interested in the politics of energy, I would recommend a work uh, by, she's actually affiliated with Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Her name is Margarita Balmaceda. And she's written the whole book about kind of, you know, the politics of energy in Russian-Ukrainian relations. Um, so again, Balma Seda um, is the last name. But with this, this specific cap, um, from what I understand, the cap is not as low as um, some, you know, advocates of Ukraine and Ukrainian government were hoping for. I think the Poles and the Baltic, uh, the leaders of Baltic countries were pushing for a lower cap. But there was, of course, in the EU, they have to have a consensus decision. And other countries didn't want the lower cap. So my sense, again, not being an expert on this, I think it's better than nothing, right? Um, it seems to be, right, would, it, would countries follow it? Um, what would be the cost of production? Like now it seems like the cost of production are quite a bit lower in Russia than $60 a barrel. I think the cost of production I read is something around 40. But I also read that in the Russian state budget for next year, they budgeted $100 a barrel as the price of oil. So if they're only going to get 60 instead of their planned 100, that seems like it would still hurt them, right? Even though, again, this price cap is not as low as some advocates, uh, you know, of harsher treatment of harsher measures were advocating. Um, is France and Europe trying to make Ukraine negotiate with Russia for peace? Uh, yes and no, uh, because, I mean, officially, of course, you know, they're all saying that, you know, Ukraine, it's, Ukraine gets to decide what it wants, you know, what it's willing to, you know, negotiate away and, and what have you. But then, you know, and Macron, I think, and, and uh, you know, Germany have come a long way since the beginning of the war from this sort of seeing kind of Putin as this more or less benign, 
you know, political force and engaging in this, you know, not seeing a problem with the uh, extensive economic dependency that Europe developed on Russian energy, you know, this weaponization of energy that then Putin was using. But, you know, every now and then Macron would say things that sort of, you know, raise eyebrows to many Ukraine watchers. I think just recently he said something like that Russia should get security guarantees. It's like, seriously, like what kind of security guarantees are we talking about, right? Like nobody was attacking Russia. Like what security guarantee should it be getting? Uh, so, you know, so it, sometimes it seems like somewhat contradictory message is coming from French um, leader and, you know, sometimes German leader as well. But I think overall, again, from what we hear, um, there is um, that, and I would even go, go as far as saying that even if they try to push Zelensky, I don't think it's going to go because Zelensky just like there is, you saw the opinion polls, right, in the society. Any sort of, you know, leader who is going to say like, let's give Putin, I don't know, part of Donbass, right, or part of Crimea and call it a day, like, is not, like, he cannot sell that to the Ukrainian society. So, and I think this is the message that, at least informally, also, I think, uh, is being transmitted by Ukrainian political actors to their Western allies, that you have to understand that for us, it is really existential fight for survival. And look, the history of relations with Russia, look at the violations of agreements, what are you talking about, right? And I think, in the West, there is realization of this yet. And at the same time, as I said, sometimes, you know, Macron and Scholz say things that show that they're not maybe quite as convinced as Ukrainians would like them to be. Um, so um, previous Soviet Union countries supporting Ukraine. Yes, there is somewhat of a divide. I mean, just to put it uh, briefly, oh, but somebody is asking Balmaseda. Let me write in the chat. It would, um, I'm going to send it in the Balmaseda Margarita. Okay, I sent it. Oh, I think it went to Watertown um, Library. C could maybe you forward the name? Um, oh, yes, yes. See, Margarita Balmaseda, that's a scholar who works on the politics of energy in the region. Um, just very briefly on the countries and the former Soviet countries, sort of where they stand. Uh, historically, and that's the case today, the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, are very, very supportive of Ukraine. Um, then, you know, countries like Belarus, which is strongly allied with Russia, is, you know, supporting Russia, although they also have reservations. And then countries in Central Asia, which also have been in this Russia-led collective security arrangements, that they have not opposed Russia, but they have, for example, declined Russian requests to send in their troops, and they also refuse to recognize independence of these breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine, this People's Republic, so-called, of Donetsk and Luhansk, right? And then sort of there are countries like Georgia and Armenia, that are maybe, um, I don't know, I guess, I mean, they're not really supporting the invasion, right? Uh, and again, they have their own, um, you know, with Armenia, with Nagorno-Karabakh, and sort of the role Russia played um, in that in, in that conflict, you know, from peacekeeping to supporting Armenia, I think it's a little bit complicated. And Georgia, historically, has been very supportive of Ukraine, and there are still a lot of Georgian, actually, fighters who fight in the Ukrainian armed forces, but the government, the current government, is somewhat sort of more Russia friendly. So there is um, a disconnect between, I would say, at least to some extent, between the sentiment in the Georgian society, which is very pro-Ukrainian, and the sentiment within the current government, which is much more cautious. Um, Moldova, um, so um, uh, would like to answer. OK, is Moldova next? Um, I mean, that has been. Uh, if uh, it, you know, if we go back to the slideshow that I had, um, the one that showed so-called Navarosia, this new Russia, right, this imperial const construct that kind of the southern part of the Russian Empire, it does extend all the way to Moldova. And in Moldova, there is this breakaway region called Strandnistria that is populated by Russians and Ukrainian speakers um, that has declared essentially de facto succession from Moldova back in the 1990 or 1991. It was kind of breakaway region. So there has been, you know, an argument, and I think it's, you know, the one to be taken seriously, that had Putin succeeded in Ukraine, probably Moldova was very quite plausibly, at least the Transnistrian, that, that Republic, um, you know, this, this um, self-proclaimed sovereign entity of Transnistria would have been next, because again, Moldova is not a member of NATO, there wouldn't have been any sort of Article 5, it's very small, you know, its army clearly is, you know, nothing in comparison with Russian army. So if they succeeded capturing the south of Ukraine all the way through Odessa, and that region borders Odessa, that was, again, we don't know for a fact, but I think that's certainly plausible. Um, okay, I'm going to have to go soon, but I think I think there is still one more question, right? Could withdrawal of some NATO missiles be a viable bargaining point? Yes, I think it could be. Again, I'm not a military expert, but to me, it seems like this whole narrative, right, that NATO threatens Russia, I think is really kind of a path to nowhere, 
Because like, what does it mean? NATO is a defensive alliance. Countries have a right to enter alliances, right? Russia cannot possibly claim what they want to claim. But I think, you know, we'll be talking about different kind of world that one country can veto foreign policy of the other country. Now, the missiles, I think, is a quite distinct point that could be treated as a separate issue. Military experts could sit together and say like, okay, if you are saying this kind of missile is too close, let's talk about it. We can move the missiles, right? Like, I think that is exactly the kind of negotiation that needs to happen for the security guarantees, right, to be real kind of meaningful and so forth. And I think, again, U.S., I think, have offered that. It hasn't really gone because Russia made much more maximalist demands. But I think it would be worthwhile for Western leaders, including U.S. leaders, to keep pushing for this kind of negotiations, right? Let's talk about specific missiles, the distances, the numbers, and so forth, instead of saying, like, get out of NATO, Ukraine is ours, and all of that nonsense. So I'm that happy note. I just want to thank you so much for staying over, sharing your expertise, and answering so many questions in a rapid fire way. Yes, it was very rapid. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>